Chapter 12. First thing I do when I get to the library is walk row by row, seeing what books make me stop. Some of the titles I can't help but pull off the shelves. I try to take out as many as I can each time. Means my satchel is heavier than a bag of rocks, but I keep them right there out of sight. It's better to read in the library, sitting at my favorite table by the window, reading and listening to the sound of the other folks turning pages makes me feel like I'm in a house full of company I don't have to talk to. Miss Cook sometimes puts aside books she thinks I'll like, especially the ones by Langston Hughes. Every time she hands me one of his, she says, here's another from your namesake. I know there ain't no chance Mama named me for a poet who wrote pretty words, but it feels good to hear her say it. Red clay blues. I want to tramp in the red mud, laud and feel the red clay round my toes. I want to wade in that red mud, feel that red clay sucking at my toes. I want my little farm back, and I don't care where that landlord goes. In Langston Hughes' words, I can smell that earthy clay in the front yard, can hear the voice of my mama. I make my way over to Miss Cook's desk. Excuse me, ma'am. She looks up. Is Mr. Langston Hughes from Alabama? Good question. Let's see if I can find out. She gets up and walks me back to the nonfiction section. She pulls one book off the shelf and hands it to me. This is a biography by the author, so it's a good place to start. Biography, I ask. Like a story about his life? I learned that in school. Yes, exactly, she smiles. You may just find you have a, co a lot in common with your namesake. I'll check this one out, I would tell her. I can see Daddy on the stoop as I get close to the apartment. He's looking for me, so I pick up my pace. Where you been, Daddy yells, not even waiting for me to walk up the steps. He don't wait for an answer. Something happened, happened, and I got to go. Where are we going? I ask, scared. Not we, me. You gonna stay here. In the apartment, Daddy's suitcase is sitting on the bed, piled with clothes, his black suit and tie on top. Where are you going? I don't know when I've been more scared. Daddy sits on the bed. Son? He starts, your grandma took a turn. Your Aunt Lena called me at my job. She passed this morning. Grandma? Feels like I can't breathe. I'm going to come with Cant Langston. Barely got enough for one fare, let alone two. My boss said I can take a week and settle my affairs. Then I'll be back. But, Daddy, how am I going to? Now I talk to Pearl, Miss Fulton, and she's going to look in on you every day. Going to make your meals and such and see you off to school while I'm gone. I can't imagine this day getting any worse, but it just did. The last morning I saw Mama alive. Grammy sent me off to school. You're not doing anybody any good sitting around with that long face, she told me. I'll look after your Mama. She'd want you in school. Grandma said as she fixed me a big plate of fried eggs. But after school, just before I got to the house, I could see I could see Pastor Lawson coming down the front steps, and I could see Daddy's big arm around Grandma's shoulders and Grandma wiping her eyes with her handkerchief. I ran hard as I could. Time I got to the porch, I was out of breath, and I knew why the pastor was there. She's gone, I screamed, running into the house. Mama was laid out on the bed. Grandma had brushed out her hair, put her in a clean gown. And now, Grandma, she'll never get a chance to see Chicago. I sit down to keep my head from spinning. Daddy jumps up and snaps his suitcase shut. Gotta leave now if I'm gonna make the train. I wrap my arms around Daddy's waist, my head in his chest. His shirt still has the sour smell from the plant, paper plant. Probably ain't done this since I was little, but I don't care. Don't want Daddy to go and leave me alone in Chicago. Feels like I'm losing everyone. Can I go too? I sound like a baby, but I don't care. Already explained it, Langston. I'll be back in one week. He pulls free and heads for the door. As I hear him go down the stairs, I sprawl on my bed. No tears, no fussing, just my head filling with pictures of my grandma. There's a knock on the door, and I don't need to guess who it is. I take my time getting up. I open the door, and Miss Fulton steps in without being invited. I'm so sorry about your grandmother, Langston, she says. She takes a look around the apartment. So I guess your daddy told you I'll be checking in on you? Yes, ma'am. Supper should be ready soon. You must have homework to do. You can get started on that, and I'll knock when it's time to eat. Would you be more comfortable sitting with me across the hall? Miss Fulton looks nervous. 
No, ma'am, I'll stay here and do my homework. Okay, then. Over supper, I can see Miss Fulton is trying, and I know I should be trying back. But between my daddy being gone and my grandma passing on, I can't make myself. How was school today? Miss Fulton asks. Fine, I say. I'll say one thing for Miss Fulton. She can put together some dinner. I ain't had a meal this good since I left home. Pork chops smothered in gravy. Green beans floating in butter. Cornbread hot and fluffy. I'm about to burst, but I can't stop eating. You are hungry, she says, as I scoop more gravy onto my plate to dip the rest of my cornbread. Yes, ma'am. I don't look up again till the cornbread is gone and my plate is clean.